Hello there, and welcome to episode 8 of my advanced tutorial series for Dwarf Fortress. In this Let's Play series, I'm building a nice and tidy fortress with you, explaining everything on the way there, and today we're going to see the end of the preparation phase. Usually at the beginning or the middle of the second year, the fortress is bustling with activity when the new migrants will arrive. We have already prepared a lot of goodness here. So there's a trap corridor and those bridges are linked to the levers and if necessary we can hermetically lock off our fortress from any outside intruders. So we've selected this area to be the first bridgehead into the caverns because it has no ceiling, uh, it has a ceiling directly above it. So it is going to be a wonderful first entrance point into the caverns. But I'm not going to breach into the caverns as of currently because there's just too much work at hand. When you go into this screen here, this is the tasks screen, and here you can check out what's currently to be done. And as you see here, my dwarves have a very 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 long list of things that they are currently ought to do and the thing is if i'd be adding more on top of this list it wouldn't be too uh, too good and this area here is going to be of utmost importance to get finished as fast as possible simply because you know we don't want to be um, assaulted by any nasties so we're going to give our workers all the time they require to finish these tasks. At the same time, I have created a uh, comparable trap corridor here. So work is uh, also not really done yet, but uh, to a pretty, pretty okay spot. We're going to go and have some fun today with some other things because I figured that we're not done yet, so we're going to go deeper downstairs while we're waiting for the new people to arrive. So here are the veins of tetrahedrite and uh, cassiterite that are currently giving our fortress something to work with, and I figured it is about time to just go deeper until we breach the third layer of the caverns, because, you know, it is just about time and we just might do something with our time you know because um currently i could just be sitting there and uh watch my dudes do their uh everyday work but currently well there's a lot of uh, bronze that i prepared for the military but i also don't want to forge things as of now because the construction jobs are way more important for me i am also preparing at the same time a lot of uh, apartments here for the new migrants we are currently ready to host a total of 40 people but i am somewhat afraid that more that our um, population count might exceed the 40 when the next wave hits and basically the size of the third migrational wave in my experiences is directly dir uh, directly proportional to to how successful your fortress is in creating wealth and exporting wealth and uh, all these things that are these are influencing the um direct um, directly the amount of people that want to live at your place or at least it uh, totally felt like that whenever i was playing toward fortress the more successful i i got at playing this game the more people came and just right on cue the folks are arriving so let's see how much our population count will rise we've struck cassiterite that's magnificent news and the best part about it is we still haven't heard anything about breaching into any other layer of caverns this is a piece of good news because that means the layers that house all the valuables are really darn deep that means we really got a lot of uh, stuff there so our population just struck 52. 52 is a very very important number not 52 50 exactly so after your fortress has 
reached the population count of 50, a couple of nasty things that can happen to your fortress get unlocked. Namely, Snatchers. These are goblin ambushers that try to kidnap children from your fortress. Really good defenses against that are cage traps and stonefall traps and watchdogs. So we're going to get us, uh, well, I don't know what I have there. We're going to get us our war dogs and uh, we're going to put them here into guard duty. So here we go, putting up two of these ropes and we're going to put the dogs in between. Let's put the last rope in front of this here as well. The thing is, animals can spot stealth enemies, and before you ask yourself, yes, there are stealth enemies, and uh, it's it's quite important to snoop them out before, before they do snoop out you, you know? That's really, really important. So, this direction is uh, growing aquiferous again, so we cannot build too many apartments here. And we are again under apartment pressure, because with the 52 people that we got there, we don't have enough apartments for everybody. Mm -hmm. And with the arrival of the third migrational wave, you also are put into a sort of a, uh, sort of a growth pressure let's call it like that because you know as long as your fortress is successful more people will come and therefore you will have to constantly work with a uh, ever increasing number of people swarming to your fortress at the same time you get more and more work uh, more and more workers and hands to work with so it is totally worth the effort so Let's get into another thing that I was totally looking forward to now that we have more people. Let's head over to the smithies. So I want to craft gear for my dudes. So let's get on over and assign, let's see if we have what we got here. So we have one proficient metal crafter, but we don't have anybody who's really strikingly good at weapon or armor crafting. That is a shame. The metal crafters, they can, they um, their skills are good for everything that's metal furniture, like uh, statues and stuff. But uh, if you have any expert weapon or armor smiths at your hand, utilize them. Here, well, we're going to train our own people, I guess. So let's see what we can do here. Um, it seems as if my mining people are also my foraging people that's that's bad so we're going to set up one one specific uh, workshop here for a weaponsmith so well let's pick this guy here the carpenter will now turn into a weaponsmith it might be that i'm going to change that at some point in the future but for now we're going to utilize this so basically i want to do one thing all the weapons in this fortress are furthermore to be forged at this plot by this worker, so all the weapon forging experience will be funneled into that one person. You can do the same thing for armor, and I personally would even recommend to you, because you know, it is quite powerful to have high quality gear. I, am, I cannot overstate what quality does matter in this game when it comes down to gear. So our first squad I want to um, staff out with short swords. So we're going to make 10 of these at this uh, workshop. I dedicate this job specifically to this uh, workshop and we're going to go and dedicate another person here to be our armor smith. So another option you could go for would be to, um, well, let's pick up somebody here, a cheesemaker. The other option you could go for would be to go into the labor menu and add a new work detail and assign the job of smithing to certain people over this menu. That works as well. You can go as you see fit. I personally like to do it like that like I do here because I find the job designators in this menu highly confusing and it is much easier to say all the armor at one place by one dwarf and this way you know 
it's it's the same thing just wrapped up in a different way so we have our first petition for a guild wall so when enough people are working in a certain uh, business they are always petitioning sooner or later to have a guild hall. A guild hall is a spot where the people of a certain craft will meet up and show their skills each other and educate one another and it's a pretty good thing to have these. So we're going to set up one guild hall here in this room that I originally wanted to dedicate into a temple but that didn't come together because of Aquifera's Rock. So this is going to be the farmer's guild hall. So the, the thing here is um, once you accept that petition the game doesn't offer you any readouts about that you accepted that guild, that petition and that you have how much time you have to complete it it's a year by the way if you're asking yourself so we're approving that and the easiest trick when i found so far was you know we're going to dedicate now a meeting area here which is going to be the guild hall and we're going to go here into the guild hall menu and now you see you have a bajillion of guilds every single freaking job and uh, sadly the game ain't smart enough yet to sort the established guilds on top of the list. Don't ask me why it is like that. But there is a nice trick. You either memorize what kind of uh, guild there was or you desperately uh, browse through them. I know what I'm looking for. Until you notice that... Where's the farmer? Here. That you see this here. Guild. The natural hall. There these guilds, they automatically establish themselves once there are 10 people working at that job. Then they go to you and ask, please make us a guild hall. So basically, you can always look for the jobs that have already that cyan text here. Then you know what you're looking for. It is clunky. I know. I know. Okay. I, I don't say that this is a uh, wonderful working system at all but uh, I'm just trying to help you out here. So the thing is, we're not done with that. When a guild hall is being requested, it is only done once the interior value exceeds a certain amount of dwarf bucks, the 2000 in total. That's why I'm also always adding the walls into the environment and putting floor in here, as you see, is increasing the value again because floor tiles are worth more than unfloored tiles. The doors I'm putting in are also increasing the value and so on and so forth. So all in all, these are, we're, we're right now trying to grind up value for that building. The very easiest way to do this is to manufacture very valuable items and, uh, <clears throat> and put them in there, namely uh, statues. So we're, we're going to go and... Uh, craft ourselves our first uh, statue. We got bronze, so let's use it. So bronze statue, boom. We're going to leave the, this first one to the artist. I'm going to make this an urgent task because I want to see it done. And as you see here, the, the workshop is already uh, starting to go into action. Let's see, we got 118 bronze bars. That's more than enough. Coke and charcoal, well, I want to make some more. The thing here is, we got now 52 people. That's almost double as much as uh, as before. So we can churn out new work uh, assignments as we see fit. No biggie, no problem. We can really, really now do a lot more. So let's do and create, let's create some more um, fuel. And most importantly, let's create the gear for the first squad. So this dude here, we're going to go and, uh, well, we're going to make sure that this is all going to be produced by him. So a full set of gear for uh, Dwarven military. Bronze helm. In this scenario, it's all bronze. Breastplate. Mail shirt. Gauntlets. Greaves. And high boots. Wait a sec. Can't I? 
Oh, um, sometimes you're... Uh, is that one of the occasions? I heard that sometimes your civilization doesn't know how to make high boots. I think, uh, yeah, sometimes they don't show up in your list. That's, uh, I'd say, a rare occasion. <laughs> so if you can make, uh, make high boots, if you can't make low boots, it is as it is. So this is a... Uh, we're missing out the shields. You can make shields also out of wood if you'd want to. So this is a uh, this is a typical kit for your uh, for your people. So we are going to make both things here because we want to make things uh, tidily. So the easiest way that I see here to fuse my both methods together is we're going to make one orderly now for. Uh, not orderly, one order for metal smithing. So I'm going to make this here. So rename that into smiths. And uh, now we're going to go for the cheese maker, this dude, and the uh, carpenter here. So these guys are now going to be exclusively the people that do the smithing here. We could now assign a third person here because, you know, since we have three smithies. So let's see. Dabbling blacksmith. See, I always get uh, confused with these uh, with these job designators and I'm pretty sure it is, uh, it is uh, easily uh, understandable. So let's make that... Uh, last peasant or, or dude this guy is going to go for the jobs here so this way we're going we're now almost done now the last thing that i want to do here let's get into these people and here into the labor menu and i want to make sure that they really only do what they're assigned to because if you don't do it like that you might end up with those smithies just not getting um, operated because as you see there they love to do all manner of different things this way i'm making sure that these guys are really just doing smithy labor and if they don't do smithy labor, they don't do anything and just chill and have a good life. You know, by the end of your expansion in your fortress, you will have 200 people on average. It is totally okay for your specialists to just slack off until, you know, until their services are needed again. Totally okay. So let's see if our uh, cheese maker is uh, now... Let's follow our cheesemaker in his uh, in his life. And oh, let's see. He's going for a little bit of a chill. It should work, though. Right now, he's not doing anything. And we got a stone crafter withdrawing from society. So whenever you do things like I did here, where you do such uh, some, some specific assignments like these, it's always worth um, checking if they, if they really work out. And don't worry if something like this here happens. Sometimes your dwarves just need a little bit of social time. They just need a little bit of uh, chill out time, you know? The, your, your dwarves are also only people. They sometimes need to chill out and uh, do their thing. So we're going to continue our, our doings. And uh, let's see. Another person is creating an artifact. Two boulders of gneiss were all it took. So let's see. We hopefully get our, um, get our uh, work duty here done by... I am very, very inclined to uh, withdraw the... Let's do this differently. This guy doesn't seem to shine here. So, as you see, we, you can also just uh, go and uh, assign somebody else to that task. It's just very important if you do so. So, let's do this. Don't forget to reassign the uh, workshop to that person. Let's see if that uh, spinner is more of a uh, good fit there. Sometimes it's also your uh, manager not not getting their job done. If this uh, green check mark is not uh, in, it's uh, just the manager not doing their job. Some dwar sometimes dwarves are just uh, taking a uh, longer time with slacking off. 
it is just uh, a very, very, it's very, very uh, different. But as you see here, now these tasks are all locked in and all the experience is now going to get funneled into that one dwarf. This way of operating also is slower, you know? We got a mug, congratulations. It's a pretty slow way of uh, creating gear, admittedly. So we're going to bind our last uh, dude here to the same task and I'm going to repeat the um, the same um, things here because uh, sadly you, you have to do this uh, again, you know. You either automate it completely or you um, do it as I do here. I'm personally, I personally went away from automation out of the simple reason because, you know, usually I only create a set of gear for my, um, for my military once, and then I'm done with that topic. So usually I have like 40 soldiers, so I'm, I'm torturing myself through this procedure like four times and then, then I'm done forever. I don't see, I don't really see the, the big, big benefits of automating armor production, but uh, I leave that up to you. These are just my personal thoughts. This game is wildly, um, is, is, is deep in a wild way and therefore adapted to your own liking. It's, uh, I just, I'm just here to uh, to show you the ropes, you know? We're going to go and uh, make ourselves some more bronze here. And as you see here, the the business down here is, uh, is, is, is is teeming with life. So we are going to go down here, and uh, sadly the barracks ain't done yet, but that's no props. We're going to set up the barracks here, and uh, well, I want to have some military right now, so let's appoint a militia commander. Obviously, we don't have anybody who's a really, really good fit, so let's appoint the cheesemaker. He was trying to get around work before. He's not going to get around work this time. So we're going to create a new squad now, and I'm going to assign metal armor because that's a really nice starting template. So we're going to assign now four people. Just uh, let's take some animal people and a uh, and a dyer. Here we go. So these people are going to be the, f the first four of our military. No thanks, no bards needed. And we have a first mayor. Wonderful. So another thing to take care of. As I said, once the third migrational wave hits town, your 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 tasks are multiplied. So we're going to go here for these guys to get them uh, settled down before we head on over to the next task. So, these guys have here almost uh, nothing on their hands, and to make sure they equip their gear, I give them a constant training schedule, and then I assign the barracks to them. Here you go, for training purposes. And now their job is to do constant training. To do so, they immediately grab their gear and start training where the barracks is at. Because gear is currently still being made, as you see, there's still a lot of red dots here, but they will go down here and start training. That's a pretty good thing. So let's continue staffing out our underground, uh, our little underground resort here. So there's going to be stockpile zones here for drink. Here for food. And we get a Baron right and oh boy. Did I? Yes. Mm. Lucky. So sometimes the Baron somewhere dies and sometimes one of your migrants happens to be the direct heir to that title and sometimes you get to have the pleasure of having a Baron in your fortress way before a natural cycle of time. We were that lucky. I mean, I'm not that salty about it because it is a perfect opportunity for me to, to feature this in this tutorial series, but uh, well, experienced players will surely chuckle with some understanding about that situation, why I am not that happy about that. 
So let's continue. I want to have all these things down here. So we're going to have this stockpile here for prepared meals. You might already uh, have grown familiar with the procedure and a stack pile for mugs. So these little base camps, I, I really grew accustomed to that uh, to that um, habit by now because it goes such a long way and it's so freaking helpful. We're going to put down the remaining um, chairs and tables once the flooring here is done, but basically that's all it takes. I think the dining hall requires doors. Oh, well, it, uh, yes, it does. <laughs> So, let's put some doors in it. Doors are always a good idea. And let's declare this a dining hall. So this way, your uh, your military dwarves will have a very, very short commute to full, uh, to, go, uh, to take care of their bodily needs. So, the preparations for the military are running now on in high gears and, uh, well, there's really nothing we need to do. The human caravan has arrived and they can they can human all day. You know, we already know how trading works and I'm currently not in the, in the mood of accepting any trade. So we're going downstairs one entire layer here because, you know, we have a lot of work on our hands. First off, we don't have apartments yet for all the new rivals. Let's change that. And the other thing is we have to take care of our newly elected mayor and the freshly inherited baron. So let's take care that these things get produced. So we have already pre-produced uh, pre items that we require for that, cabinets and chests, but um, people of higher standing, they also need weapon racks and armor stands. So we're going to assign these here as well. So. I currently don't have any too valuable materials, so we're going to assign our smelters to create some billon. Billon is a wonderful material that I love to use for these jobs because it is of a uh, acceptable value and it helps us out a lot. Also, we shall not forget about the guild hall there. So as you see, like I said, there's all, all of a sudden a bajillion different tasks popping up and that's when you're uh, knee deep into a fortress. So let's check out the guild hall in between. And as you see here, it's still not nearly enough money in, in terms of value. So we have to work on that as well. We have made one statue. Let's uh, check it out in this uh, area here. Uh, I thought statues would be here. Well, all right. So a statue is worth 140 dwarf bucks. This is not insanely much. So let's use our jewelers to help us out here. So I'm creating a new stockpile zone here, which I'm going to create, and it's going to accept only statues. Here we go. And for that purpose, I'm going to create a second jewelers workshop because I want to have a uh, specific setup for that. But I don't think we're going to complete that during this episode. But, you know, we're going to use this feature quite a lot. Another thing that you can do to increase the value of your guild hall without having to build anything are engravings. But uh, engravings need to be configured accordingly. So first off, we're going to select one or two people to be our engravers henceforth. I'm going to take two because I don't want to have these jobs hanging around forevermore. So we're going to take the animal dissector and the thrasher. These people are going to be our chief engravers. This is the same logic as with many and as in many parts of Dwarf Fortress. We want to funnel the, the job XP into as few as uh, possible people. Some people even go as far and only assign one engraver to uh, get that job done as fast as possible, you know, to get them on legendary experience level. I personally like to go for it too. It should, you can do that as you, want, as you see yourself fit. The engraving job is important the experience is important because unlike smoothing, it does not only in 
influence the speed, but also the quality of these engravings. These qualities the influence directly the value of the engraving, and therefore a very experienced engraver is going to go crazy value-wise. So these first um, things that we're doing are not going to add in too much into the skill hall. So there is a high chance that we still have to do a lot of work manually. So the episode is at its end. We're going to go and take care of our nobles in the next episode. And then we're going to see if we're going to get the ability to breach into the caverns or anything like that. I'm not quite sure where we're headed after the nobles. Pretty sure the nobles won't take up the entirety of the next episode, but I'm pretty sure I will find something new until the next episode hits town. So, everybody, thanks for watching. Drop me your comments down below. I love to hear from you, and it's always wonderful to see what you guys have on your mind. Leave a thumbs up on that video to make it more visible to other people, and Drop a subscription to the channel if you want to support this channel without spending a buck. This is a wonderful way of doing so. If you hit the bell button, you also get notifications for all the things that I do. In the description box, you find a lot of playlist links to a beginner's tutorial series, to my standard tutorials, and to the playlist of this very series. So, I hope you had a good time, and I hope to see you next time as well. Until then, see you soon.